Right. We now come to questions to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, I will first call you to answer the engagements question. I will then call Michael Fabricant to ask his supplementary. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday I made a written ministerial statement updating the House on the latest position on the leak investigation, as you requested, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in wishing all members and staff a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Members from across the House will want to join me in sending also our warmest wishes to all our armed forces, both in the United Kingdom and those who are stationed overseas. Members uh, will also, I hope, want to join me in sending our very best wishes to all members of the emergency services, health and care workers, and those who will be working over Christmas. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Let's head up to Litchfield with Vital Fabricant. Vital Fabricant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And may I join the Prime Minister in those good wishes for Christmas? And may I add my own good wishes, actually, to you, Mr Speaker, and the Prime Minister, and hope that you both have a peaceful and a safe uh, Christmas period. But on the subject of Christmas, look, my constituents in Litchfield and Burntwood and the rest of the country have had a torrid year with the COVID pandemic. And we've got this very small break over Christmas. And people have got to use common sense, of course. Don't start hugging, hugging granny and not go wild over Christmas. And as my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, previously said, uh, let's be jolly careful over Christmas. But I want to say to my Prime Minister, it would not be helpful if some smarmy lawyer or somebody now at this late stage were to argue for a change in the laws. So can I ask my right honourable friend, here and now, who is not a, neither smarmy nor a lawyer, is he now? We've got the message. Going to take the rule. Come on, Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, my, my honourable friend is, is absolutely right uh, to stress the, uh, in many ways, but to stress the importance of uh, people taking care uh, this Christmas, because although some things are uh, unquestionably going well, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, very pleased to tell the House that we have had a good start with the uh, rollout of the vaccination programme, and in just seven days, 108,000 people in England, 138,000 across the whole of the UK, have received uh, their first yeah. vaccination. We must remember that transmission takes place asymptomatically in so many cases. Uh, one in three people are currently asymptomatic uh, with COVID, uh, Mr Speaker. That's why uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right uh, that we should exercise extreme caution in the way we celebrate Christmas. Uh, we can celebrate it sensibly, but we have to be extremely cautious in uh, the way we behave. We don't go to the Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honourable Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his good wishes to all the staff, to the armed forces and our emergency services? And can I thank you, Mr Speaker, and the House authorities for doing all that you've done this year to keep Parliament safe and open in yeah. challenging circumstances? Mr Speaker, since this is probably the last PMQs of the year, I want to look at some of the decisions the Prime Minister has made in the last 12 months. Let me start at the beginning of the pandemic when images from hospitals in Italy and Spain were being shown on our televisions and the infection rates were rising in the UK. Does the Prime Minister now accept that his slowness to respond led to more deaths, a longer lockdown and a deeper economic damage? Uh, Mr Speaker, no, because at every stage we followed the scientific guidance and continue to do so. And, in the, and, the, and he's right to draw attention to what's happening across the, uh, the whole of Europe. And indeed, there are spikes now taking place across the whole of the EU. And thanks to the tiering system that we have in place in uh, large parts of the country, thanks to the heroic efforts of the people of the northwest, of the northeast, Yorkshire, Humber, we're seeing those rates coming down. And yes, it's true that we have spikes 
now in, uh, in some parts of London and the South East, but we will make sure that with our adjustments to the tiering uh, that uh, we conduct over the next few weeks, that we will address those issues. That is the right way forward uh, for this country. That's how uh, we'll defeat the virus, with vaccines, uh, with community testing and with tough tiering. And I think what people would like to hear uh, in this season of goodwill uh, to all men is a little bit of support uh, from the right honourable gentleman uh, for what the government is trying to do uh, to beat coronavirus and perhaps uh, just a little less carping. Pierre Starmer. Well, Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister won't listen to me, can I quote his own spending watchdog, the Office of Budget Responsibility? Because they said the UK locked down later and for longer than some of its European neighbours and experienced a deeper fall and slower economic recovery. Mr Speaker, this isn't bad luck. It's not inevitable. It's a result of the Prime Minister's choices. But if the Prime Minister disagrees with me, perhaps he can tell us why does he think that Britain, the sixth richest country in the world, with all our brilliant scientists and amazing NHS, ends the year with one of the highest numbers of COVID deaths in Europe, over 64,000, each one leaving a grieving family, and the deepest recession of any major economy? Why does he think that has happened? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, the House will have noted his slight change of tune in his criticisms of the of the UK uh, performance, but perhaps he could tell me uh, why it is that the UK, uh, why the UK is the is the first uh, to produce a, a viable treatment for uh, coronavirus in the form of dexamethasone, or the first country in the world uh, to roll out a clinically tested stage three uh, vaccine. Mr. Speaker, this is a pandemic that has affected uh, the whole of. Europe and uh, this government has continued to take uh, the tough decisions necessary to beat it. And uh, I may say so, Mr. Speaker, without uh, wishing to uh, cast aspersions on the point of view of the uh, of the honourable gen- right, on- right honourable uh, gentleman. I would take his criticisms of uh, the UK government's decisions a little more seriously, frankly. If he had been able to, to decide last week. Uh, or even the week before, whether he even supported uh, the approach we were taking or opposed it. He couldn't do either, Mr Speaker. He abstained. Mr Speaker, I said two weeks ago at this dispatch box that I was very concerned that Tier 2 would not be strong enough to hold the virus. The Prime Minister said, don't worry about that, just support us, throw away the problems. Two weeks later, what have we got? The virus rising in Tier 2 and Tier 3, and I'll come back to that. But if the Prime Minister thinks that the highest death numbers and the deepest recession is somehow delivering for the British people, he's a long way removed from the truth. The problem is the Prime Minister makes the same mistakes over and over again. And two weeks ago, he unveiled that latest COVID plan. He told the House, as he's done so many times before, that his plan would suppress the virus. But the latest figures show the opposite, and the Prime Minister said spikes here and there. Let me tell the House, in three out of four Tier 2 areas, infections are going up. In over half of the Tier 3 areas, infections are going up. Exactly the concern I put to the Prime Minister two weeks ago when he said, just back us anyway. As a result, this morning, 10 million people moved into tougher restrictions, exactly what we said would happen going up the tiers. Does the Prime Minister not recognise that his latest plan has once again failed to control the virus, protect the NHS and our economy? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, once again he criticises the government's plans without uh, producing any kind of plan uh, of his own. And actually, if you look at what is happening, if you look at what is happening, he was, except he was the mastermind author of the, I seem to remember, of the, of the Labour firebreak uh, in, in Wales, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but if you look at what is happening across the country, it is thanks to the efforts of the, of the British people uh, that we are seeing significant reductions in uh, the virus in some of the areas where it was really surging. And that is because of the hard work of the people of this country. And uh, we will, of course, be continuing to reflect that as we go forward with the tiering approach. And we will continue uh, to roll out uh, the vaccine and roll out community testing, uh, Mr Speaker. And I may say, I think that his time would be better employed supporting 
uh, those wonderful initiatives. Uh, supporting uh, community testing, encouraging people uh, to get a test, encouraging people uh, to get a vaccine, rather than continually attacking uh, what the NHS and what the government is trying to do. Everybody to have the vaccine every time I've stood up and talked about it. But the Prime Minister is avoiding the issue. In some places, Prime Minister, in the last seven days, infection rate has gone up 70%. Everybody knows this is a problem. The Prime Minister is yet again pretending it isn't. Another major mistake of the last 12 months, losing public trust. We all know what the tipping point was. The 520-mile round trip to Barnard Castle and the, the humiliating way in which the Prime Minister and his Cabinet chose to defend it. And now we learn, now we learn that while the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are telling the armed forces, police officers, care workers and firefighters that they will get a pay freeze, Dominic Cummings has been handed at least a £40,000 pay rise. How on earth does the Prime Minister justify that? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, he totally trivialises the efforts of the British people uh, in, in, in in getting the virus down, he, he says, uh, and, and, and he, he says that uh, the, the, the none of the measures, none of the lockdown measures, uh, have worked. It's absolutely untrue, Mr. Speaker. From uh, from November the fifth to December the third, the people of this country came together once again uh, to get the virus under control, and they may have made a huge amount of progress. We will continue with that tiering system and uh, we will get that virus down. And that is, the, that is the best way forward for this country. All he wants to do, Mr Speaker, is to lock the whole country down. That's, he's a one-club golfer. That's the only solution he has. And then, and then, Mr Speaker, all he does is attack the economic consequences of lockdowns. Mr Speaker, you could script that from October and November, when he was saying a lockdown is the last thing the country needs disastrous. Two weeks later, he put it on the table and voted for it. Ridiculous. It's exactly the problem that we've got. Not learning from mistakes. And obviously we know about Dominic Cummings. It wasn't performance-related pay, Mr Speaker. But I think the, the British people will find it pretty hard to understand why it's one rule for our key workers and another for his advisers. And it's now likely that the next big mistake will be over the easing of restrictions over Christmas. And this isn't smarmy lawyers. Let me give you the British Medical Journal. The British, British Medical Journal yesterday said this. We believe the government is about to blunder into another major error that will cost many lives. The Prime Minister should listen to that advice, not just ignore it as usual. And if he really is going to press ahead with this, can he tell us what's the assessment and has it been done of the impact that it will have on infection rates and increased pressure on the NHS. What's the impact? Well, Mr Speaker, I wish he'd have the, the, the guts just to say what he really wants to do, which is to, to cancel the plans people have, have made and, and cancel, uh, cancel Christmas. That's really, that's what he, I think that's what he's driving at, Mr Speaker. Uh, he's, look, uh, he's looking a bit blank. Uh, I think that's what he's driving at. But I can tell him that as of today and just, uh, just, uh, just, uh, just this morning, there is actually, as, as I say, unanimous agreement across all the uh, UK government, across all the devolved administrations, uh, including members of all parties, Mr Speaker, including uh, his own, that we should proceed. Uh, in principle, with the existing uh, regulations, uh, Mr. Speaker, because we don't want to criminalise people's long-made plans, Mr. Speaker. But we do think we do think it's absolutely vital that people should, at this very, very tricky time, exercise a high degree of personal responsibility, especially when they come into contact uh, with elderly people and avoid uh, contact with elderly people uh, wherever possible. And that is how, that is how, by being sensible and cautious, not by imposing endless lockdowns or cancelling Christmas, as he would appear to want to do. That, well, that's the only implication I can draw from what he said, Mr Speaker, unless he wants to announce some other idea. That is the way we will continue to work together to keep this virus under control, to defeat it and take the country forward. Here we go again, Mr Speaker, ignoring the medical advice. And we know, we know where that leads because we've seen what happened in the last nine months. And whatever the Prime Minister says, there's no escaping the brutal facts that Britain has one of the highest number of COVID deaths in Europe and the worst economic damage. Mr Speaker, as this is the last PMQs of the year, 
I, for one, often wonder where the Prime Minister gets his advice from. Well, now I know, because I've heard the official newsletter of the Wellingborough Conservative Party. Uh, it, 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 it's not on everyone's Christmas reading list, but it is a fascinating read, because it gives a lot of advice to wannabe politicians. It says this, say the first thing that comes into your head. <laughs> It'll probably be nonsense. You may get a bad headline, but if you make enough dubious claims fast enough, you can get away with it. <laughs> and it, it includes the December edition, the advice. Sometimes it's better to give the wrong answer at the right time rather than the right answer at the wrong time. <laughs> So, my final question to the Prime Minister, my final question to the Prime Minister is this. Is he the inspiration for the newsletter or is he the author? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I think what the people of this country would love to hear from the right honourable gentleman this season of, uh, of goodwill is, is any kind of point of view at all on some of the key, on some of the some of the key issues. I mean, he, this, this week he couldn't make up his mind whether it was right for kids to be in, in school or not, and, and uh, havering uh, completely. He couldn't make up his mind last week uh, whether or not to support uh, what the government was doing to fight COVID and told his troops heroically to, to abstain. He couldn't make up his mind about Brexit, you'll seem to remember. We don't know whether he'll vote uh, for a deal or not. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, uh, he can't attack the government. He can't attack the government if he can't come up with a view of his own. If he, or, uh, Mr Speaker, in the words of the song, oh, from all I want for Christmas is a view, Mr Speaker. And, and, and it would be wonderful if, if one of you could produce one. This government is getting on with delivering on the people's priorities. We are uh, 20,000 more police, uh, 50,000 more nurses, 48 new hospitals, and, and Mr Speaker, but, and although it has been very tough, and very difficult. And everybody appreciates the suffering and hardship that the people of this country uh, have been going through. We are, by rolling out uh, the vaccine, by community testing and by tough tiering, which I hope he supports, we are going to defeat coronavirus, Mr Speaker, and we're going to take this country forward into a great 2021. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. At the beginning of this year, the Prime Minister delivered the historic British people's votes for Brexit. Regardless of the outcome of the current talks with the EU, does he agree with me that this great outward-looking nation has a world of global opportunities ahead of it? Yeah. Well, I thank my hon. Friend, who campaigned nobly in that cause, and uh, as, as he knows already, we've not only set up uh, a, a points-based Im immigration system taking back control of our, uh, of our borders, uh, but we'll also ensure that we set up, uh, and we've already done uh, many free trade deals, but we will use the economic advantages uh, of Brexit uh, to uh, uh, coming out of the European Union uh, to do free ports to make this country the most attractive place uh, for investment, for business, for enterprise around the world, uh, and above all, to resist the depredations of the socialists uh, opposite uh, who would destroy uh, that opportunity and do everything they possibly could, Mr Speaker, to take us straight back into the lunar pull of the European Union, which is the true ambition of the Right Honourable Gentleman. Let's go to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I wish you all colleagues, uh, all staff, and of course our essential workers, our health workers, and indeed everyone in these nations, uh, all the best for Christmas and that everyone does their best to keep everybody safe. Mr Speaker, in the last few hours, the President of the European Commission said that the next few days are going to be decisive in the Brexit negotiations. With just two weeks to go, it is a disgrace that businesses and people have been left with this crippling uncertainty and the real threat of food and medicine shortages come the new year. One year ago, at the general election, Scotland rejected this Prime Minister, rejected this Tory government and rejected their extreme Brexit. People in Scotland now need to know the price they will be forced to pay. Ahead of any vote in Parliament, will the Prime Minister commit to releasing a detailed economic impact assessment of the cost to the UK of his extreme Tory Brexit plans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, there's every opportunity, notwithstanding the slight error of uh, uncharacteristic error of gloom uh, from the uh, right honourable gentleman, uh, there's every opportunity, that every hope I have that our, our friends and partners uh, across the Channel will uh, will see sense and 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 do a deal. Uh, and all that that takes is for them to understand that the UK has a, a natural right, like every other country, uh, to want to be able uh, to control its own laws and its own uh, fishing grounds, which ought to be important, I, thought, uh, I would have thought, uh, to the right honourable uh, gentleman. But whatever happens in the next few days, I know that this country uh, is, will prosper mightily. Uh, on the terms that we agree uh, with our European friends, uh, whatever they may be, whether they're Australian or Canadian, he can go forward with a high heart and confidence into 2021, knowing there are great opportunities for Scotland and the rest of the UK. Ian Black. I'm not quite sure what that was, Mr Speaker, because it certainly wasn't an answer to the question. And I'm not surprised, because the Prime Minister didn't want to answer the question, because he knows that the United Kingdom is poorer and worse off as a result of the extreme Tory Brexit, and the costs continue to soar. The Warwick study estimates that Scotland has already lost £4 billion as a result of Brexit. Bloomberg Economics estimate the UK has lost £200 billion by the end of this year, and Scottish Government analysis estimates every person in Scotland, on average, will be worse off to the tune of £1,600. Mr Speaker, Scotland has been completely ignored by Westminster throughout the Brexit process, and now we're being kept in the dark over the devastating price we'll be forced to pay. People in Scotland aren't willing to suffer the consequences of this economic vandalism. Sixteen consecutive polls have shown a majority for independence, and Mr Speaker, it's little wonder. Isn't it as clear as day that the only way left to protect Scotland's interests and our place in Europe is for Scotland to become an independent country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, not with, not uh, despite the gloom that uh, the uh, right honourable gentleman seeks to spread about Scotland and the, and the rest of the UK. The UK uh, currently has uh, the highest youth employment in the, the G7. I point perhaps I could have made to with advantage of the right honourable gentleman opposite, uh, and uh, lower unemployment than uh, France, Italy, Spain, uh, United States, and and Canada. And uh, of, of course, uh, the, there is a threat to, to the Scottish economy, sadly, and that is the, the high-tax uh, regime, uh, the mismanagement of the Scottish Nationalist Party. Yeah. That, is the, that is the problem that Scotland faces, and I, I, I hope that the people of Scotland can see it. Mr Speaker, as my right honourable friend knows, the tourism and hospitality sector in constituencies across the country, but particularly in Derbyshire Dales, have been severely affected by the pandemic and also the national restrictions. Places like the Flying Childers Pub in Stanton in the Peak. What support and hope can this government give this sector in the weeks and months ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I thank my honourable friend for everything she does to campaign for Derbyshire Dells and for hospitality, and it's been a terrible time for hospitality. We all uh, share the anguish of those who work in the hospitality uh, sector. That's why we've cut VAT for tourism uh, uh, and cut uh, the VAT overall, as she knows, from 20% to, to 5% in those sectors until the end of, of March. And uh, we're going to uh, develop, uh, with her help, a tourism recovery plan uh, to help people in particular uh, to come to uh, see the beauties of the Derbyshire Dales. Colin Basewood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, last week, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said that Northern Ireland would have the best of both worlds as a result of the talks with the European Union. Well, for that to be true, we need access to both UK and EU trade deals. Can he confirm whether or not he is pushing for this in those talks? Yeah. Uh, 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 grateful. Of course, uh, as the uh, agreement with our, our friends has already made clear, uh, the, the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland, will participate fully in all uh, trade deals that the UK does, and Northern Ireland will continue to have unfettered access uh, to the, the whole of the GB, uh, the UK market. To James Davies. Mr Speaker, at the recent spending review, over £14 billion was allocated for research and development, and this was excellent news. But there's a concern that charity-funded medical research, which has been hit hard by the pandemic, will still be left behind. 
So will my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, intervene to ensure that some of this funding is used to set up a Life Sciences Charity Partnership Fund to boost medical research, protect thousands of skilled jobs and promote the UK's position as a science superpower? Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. And uh, I know that my honourable friend as a doctor knows the vital importance of, uh, of medical research and pure uh, science. And that's why uh, this government is, is investing record sums in uh, science, R&D, £14.6 uh, this year, 2021-2022, uh, uh, and that is going to support all the life sciences sectors. And if you want anybody wanted evidence of why it's so vital to support those sectors, uh, Mr. Speaker, they only have to look at the events of the last few months. Alex Norris, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, HS2 in full will transform the East Midlands and the North, reversing a 40-year trend of losing skilled work. In February, the Prime Minister promised it would be built in full. Yesterday's National Infrastructure Commission review reduces the eastern leg to a small line between Birmingham and the disliked station at East Midlands Parkway. This won't deliver the connectivity the Midlands and the North need, nor the economic uplift. Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister affirm his previous commitment and reject the NIC's plan, or is this yet another broken promise to our community? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm afraid the, the Honourable Gentleman is, is quite wrong. Uh, what, the, what the NIC is saying is that uh, there are other things we can do as well, uh, including massively improving the Midlands Main Line, and I think everybody would want uh, to do that. Uh, but, uh, but the ambition to do the Eastern Leg, uh, as I said in the House before, remains absolutely unchanged. Yeah. Anthony Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Like schools and teachers across the country, those in South Cambridge have been working miracles to continue providing education throughout the pandemic. They're grateful for the support they've had from government, they welcome the new exams regime, and they also very much welcome the new testing regime for coronavirus. But schools in Cambridgeshire started with some of the lowest funding of any in the country, and many have been left with deficits that they cannot fill. Will my right honourable friend work with me to make sure that schools in Cambridgeshire get the resources they need? Will, he be, will the Prime Minister be Santa for Cambridgeshire school kids? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, <laughs> thank you. Mr Speaker, the whole of the country and the taxpayers of this country uh, are, uh, play that role, and it is our, our job to make sure we spend the money uh, sensibly, and that is what we're, we're doing. And I'm delighted that, thanks uh, in part to, to the campaigning by my honourable friend, uh, his uh, constituency is attracting an average of 3.8 per cent more uh, per pupil uh, next year uh, compared to, to this year through the uh, national funding formula, a total of 4.8 million more, in addition, of course, to our commitment uh, to pay every, start, every teacher a, a starting salary of £30,000, £30, Mr Speaker. Mr West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The hospitality sector and pubs, in particular in my constituency, like the Black Bull in Bladen, a wet pub with a fine live local music tradition, have been devastated by the restrictions placed on them, in our case, since September. Pubs like the Black Bull are at the heart of our communities. The various compensation schemes don't offer enough support to allow these pubs to survive. Will the Prime Minister now commit to bringing forward a financial support scheme which will allow our pubs and hospitality sector to survive? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, she's quite right to raise the, the, the problem of, of the, in, ho in the hospitality sector, and uh, we are committed to do everything we can. Uh, the, the, she knows about the £3,000 uh, grant, the t an additional £2,100, uh, plus the, the £1,000 for, for wet pubs. But the best thing of all, uh, the best thing of all, in addition to the cuts in, uh, in business rates and VAT that I've already mentioned, the best thing uh, is for uh, areas in the, uh, in the, in the West Midlands uh, to, to work together. So, sorry, forgive me. Uh, if areas in the in the, in the northeast to work together uh, to, to reduce the virus through community testing in uh, the way that uh, Liverpool has uh, succeeded in doing. And I appreciate that she's in in tier three and things are very very tough. But if we all work together, we can get this virus down and get our pubs open again. John Morrissey. Mr Speaker, we are confident that the UK will prosper, whether uh, in a, on a Canada-style arrangement or on Australia-style terms. In light of the new opportunities which the end of the transition period will bring, is the Prime Minister aware of the ambitious economic growth proposition developed in Buckinghamshire, and will he back this bold bid for bucks 
to ensure that Buckinghamshire continues to increase its contribution to the Exchequer, a win for the businesses of Bucks and a win for the levelling up agenda. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker, and uh, I know that uh, Buckinghamshire Council uh, is working closely with uh, my honourable friend, uh, there she is, and uh, with uh, partners across the, uh, across the voluntary sector. And we have indeed uh, been in initial discussions with Buckinghamshire about their proposals and are happy to take them, take them forward. I send up to Scotland with Ronnie Cowan. Ronnie Cowan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, were you as dismayed as I was by the number of drug-related deaths reported in Scotland yesterday? Because if you were, then you can do something about it. Not just in Scotland, but across the United Kingdom, obstacles exist to the creation of drug consumption rooms. And those obstacles can be removed. Oh, 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 one second. Just to say I'm not responsible. You keep saying you. And honestly, I don't want to be responsible for any of this. Okay. <laughs> My apologies, Mr. Speaker. I am obviously addressing my question to the Prime Minister. So, the Prime Minister, the obstacles that exist across the United Kingdom to the creation of drug consumption rooms, and those obstacles can be removed at Westminster. Previously, the UK government has held an ideological view that drug consumption rooms encourage drug taking. Will the Prime Minister engage with me and allow me the opportunity to help the Prime Minister do a good thing? Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, I listened very carefully to what the Honourable Gentleman had to say. Uh, I, I, may, I must say that we don't want to do anything that, that would encourage the consumption uh, of more drugs, Mr. Speaker, nor do we want to decriminalise the possession or, uh, of, of, of drugs, because I believe that they ruin lives and drive criminality across this whole United Kingdom. But uh, I'm more than happy to look at the proposals uh, that he makes uh, one more time and indeed uh, to pursue uh, the, the, uh, the agenda of, of tackling drugs. But I may say that the majority of powers uh, that are needed, the, the vast panoply of powers that are needed uh, to tackle drugs and drugs crime are already vested uh, with the uh, devolved administration in Scotland, and I'm afraid the failures that he talks about are very largely down to them. You, Merriman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I wish you and everyone in Parliament a Merry Christmas and thank you for keeping us in our place? And can I ex extend those best wishes to the Prime Minister as well? This has been a tumultuous 12 months, but he's shown great resolve and determination in leading our nation through it. This has been a wretched year due to COVID, but the vaccination offers us a ray of hope in 2021. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that all those called upon to take the vaccine will not only be protecting their own health, but doing their civic duty and helping the health of others, keeping people in jobs and getting us back to our cherished way of life? Yeah. Well, uh, it's great to hear my honourable friend because he speaks such good sense on this matter and I hope he's heard up and down the land. It's absolutely vital that people uh, who are offered uh, the vaccine uh, do take steps to uh, get it immediately. You'll be protecting yourself and you'll be protecting everyone else. Let's head up to the North East to Sharon Hodgson. Sharon Hodgson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Highly skilled engineers at Centrica British Gas in my constituency were told last week that they had to sign new contracts before Christmas or else they would be fired and rehired in, in the new year on worse terms. Fire and rehire is an exploitative and illegitimate negotiation tactic and causes real hurt and anger. So will the Prime Minister join me in calling on Centrica to withdraw its threat and return to the negotiation table with workers and their union, the GMB? And will he work with Labour and the trade unions to introduce leg legislation to ban fire and rehire as soon as possible? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, it's very, very important that all businesses uh, treat their uh, employees with fairness and, uh, and with respect. And uh, I, I, in that sense, I utterly share uh, the point of view of the, uh, the Honourable Lady. But it is also vital, it is also vital that we have a, a flexible uh, economy that is able to generate jobs, particularly, particularly when we are going to be going through a very difficult and bumpy time, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, we've had a proud, proud record of keeping employment high, keeping unemployment low in this country, and we want to continue with that approach. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Uh, despite the challenges presented by the pandemic, working with the Council and Local Enterprise Partnership, Kirklees College has managed to open its new campus at Pioneer House in the centre of Dewsbury. Not only will the influx of students give a much needed boost to the town centre, but it will open up skills and apprenticeships to young people throughout my constituency. Would my right hon. Friend agree to accompany me on a visit to look round this iconic building and to view the amazing sculpture loaned by renowned artist Anthony Gormley as soon as his schedule and restrictions allow? Yeah. Well, I, well, I thank uh, my, my honourable friend. I will, I will do what I can to, to, to fit in his, uh, his very kind uh, invitation and uh, to, to, to inspect this sculpture. Uh, and uh, I, I admire Mr Gormley's work greatly, by the way, I should say. Uh, and, but I'm delighted that, uh, that Kirklees College has opened the Pioneer Higher Skills Centre, uh, providing high-level education and skills training for the people of Dewsbury. And I thank him for what he's doing to campaign uh, for that. We're now heading up to Scotland with John McNally. John McNally. Yeah, thank you. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister promised to fund 4,000 zero buses by 2024, but the spending review delivers just 800 buses. Why has the Prime Minister put the handbrake on when it comes to supporting the bus building sector? And with COP26 less than a year away, does the Prime Minister therefore agree with me that it is time to put the pedal to the floor, get these low and zero emission bus production lines full in Falkirk, Yorkshire and Palomino, support the bus building sector in full as he promised? Uh, well, Mrs. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I can think I can confidently say I don't believe there's another member of this House who's built as many or caused as many buses to be built as I have. And, uh, but uh, we, are, we are absolutely committed uh, to rolling out, uh, as, he, as he rightly says, uh, 4,000 uh, zero uh, emission buses uh, were, and the, the country's first all electric uh, bus town. And, uh, and, and uh, he's right to lobby for the wonderful uh, Alexander Dennis buses uh, that are built in, in Falkirk, and uh, uh, we will be certainly championing them as well as buses built in, uh, in Ballymena uh, and elsewhere. And uh, he can take it from me that in a zero carbon way, we are putting the pedal to the floor uh, until we get to 4,000. Brendan Fox. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the Prime Minister join with me in congratulating Kevin Sinfield and Leeds Rhinos Rugby League Club in raising over two and a half million pounds for the MND Association by running seven marathons in seven days in honour of Rob Burrow, who is living with motor neuron disease? And will the government commit to increasing its investment in MND research and marching on together to find a cure? Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, uh, can I share your enthusiasm for uh, for Kevin, uh, what Kevin Sinfield and, and uh, Sir Kevin, thank you, uh, and, uh, and Mr. Speaker, and Leeds Rhinos have, have done. MND is indeed a devastating uh, condition. I, I congratulate uh, Sir Kevin on his uh, on his actions, and the government uh, is certainly in full full support. Simon Mulhotra. Mr Speaker, my constituent Charlotte, a single parent, twice this term had to stop work due to her five-year-old son's class self-isolating. She's been told that because it is her son who is self-isolating, she is ineligible for the £500 support payment. The Library confirms that parents may need to use annual or unpaid leave. Isn't it wrong, Mr Speaker, to exclude parents on the lowest income from support to look after their children? And will the Prime Minister urgently look again? Wales and Scotland have done so. Why, wo why won't he now support parents in England? Yeah. Well, she, she's, of course she's, uh, she's right to, to draw attention to the, uh, the hardship of, uh, of parents who had to cope with uh, uh, kids who've come home from school because of uh, self-isolation rules. And one of the things that we're trying to do uh, now is rolling out lateral flow testing for, uh, for schools on a, on a, on a grand scale so that we reduce the, the self-isolation, reduce the size of the, uh, of the bubbles that, uh, that go home. Uh, we're doing whatever we can to support uh, families throughout this crisis, as she knows, with big up rates to, uh, to universal credit and uh, all, all, all manner of support that we are, uh, that we are providing, uh, in, in addition to, to, to free childcare uh, for 30 hours a, a week. But, Mr Speaker, the best, the best answer for this, uh, for this 
crisis is to keep our kids uh, in school, uh, to test them, and to roll out that programme of mass community testing, uh, and which I hope she supports, by the way, uh, in her neighbourhood, and I'm sure she, I'm sure she does, uh, in order to drive the virus down, allow the vaccine time really to kick in uh, and uh, protect our elderly and vulnerable so that we can all move forward together as a society. That's what this government is aiming for. But in the meantime, I thoroughly appreciate the, the problem that she's addressing and, and we, we will do our very, very best to address it. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I'm suspending the House for three minutes. Order.